Hello, welcome to the fourth in our series of short videos describing how to use the LA-19-1304A VNA. In this video, we will have a look at how to make large dynamic range measurements. Okay, let's look at the challenge. Let's start by looking at a large value attenuator, shown here on the left. Now, relatively speaking, this is an easy measurement task, mainly because we assume that the match of the device, that is S11 and S22, are good. That makes all the difference. On the other hand, making a measurement of a bandpass filter can be very difficult. The key reason is that the match of the device is good over passband of the filter, but outside the passband, we are going to have values that may be close to 0 dB return loss, and with a phase which is completely unpredictable. It is this return loss characteristic that makes life quite difficult. Let's expand on that. Here, we have a simplified block diagram of the VNA. Assume we have a situation where we want to make a measurement in the forward direction. So, we have the forward reverse switch in the forward direction here, and the test signal is diverted to port 1. As the test signal hits the device under test, some of it will get reflected back, obviously into this receiver here. But because of imperfections, some of that signal will leak through to the other side and appear as crosstalk. So this crosstalk component here will depend on the match of the device under test, the S11 of the DUT. Similarly, there will be a component due to the leakage of the switch, which will travel down to port 2. Some of that will then be reflected back from device we are testing and appear on the right-hand side here. And those two crosstalk components will depend on the match of the device under test. It is this that makes crosstalk or isolation correction difficult. Let's have a look at how we can calibrate out the crosstalk. The conventional technique is shown in this diagram. So we terminate ports 1 and 2 with, for example, 50 ohm terminations and then we measure the crosstalk. Of course, the terminations don't have to be 50 ohms. They could be short circuits or open circuits. This approach can work. You measure the crosstalk during calibration and then remove it mathematically during the measurement. The problem is that the device under test can present a match which is largely different at some frequencies to that which you use during calibration. Therefore, the correction does not work so well. Let's look at another approach. Here we have what we can refer to as the ideal technique. What we do here is to use the actual device to be tested as the termination for ports 1 and 2 during the crosstalk calibration step. This works very well, but the disadvantage is that you need two identical devices which can be quite difficult to achieve. Not impossible, but it is difficult. And the idea is that the impedance or return loss you present to ports 1 and 2 during calibration is the same as during the measurement. The idea can work very well, but it is not always practical to have two identical DUTs. So now let's look at a third approach which we use, or rather, is an option in the user interface software, and that is the enhanced isolation option. What we do is to take several crosstalk measurements and build a model to more accurately predict the crosstalk. So when we do the calibration reflection measurements for 50 ohms, short and open, we also make a crosstalk measurement. In fact, we make a total of four crosstalk measurements, 50 ohms, short, open, and also a fourth isolation step. That gives us four sets of measurements that allows us to more accurately predict the behavior of the crosstalk as a function of the match we present to ports 1 and 2. Now, it is important to remember that for this technique to work well, as indeed any other crosstalk calibration technique, you need to make sure you make the calibration measurements at the bandwidth at which you will make your DUT measurements, or even lower. So, for example, if you wish to make measurements at 100 Hz, then you should make your calibration measurements at 100 Hz, or even 10 Hz even. The enhanced isolation calibration technique can work well, but the cost is that you need to make four slow calibration measurements. Okay, so what we are going to try to do is to measure the response of a satellite receiver IF bandpass filter. We have here a heavyweight IF filter. It is a device made by A1 Microwave Limited. It has a center frequency of 1.93 GHz and a 40 MHz bandwidth. 
This device has extremely sharp response skirts and very high out of band attenuation. Okay, so the first thing we need to do is to select our calibration kits. We are going to use the serial number 8444 kit on port 1, that's a female kit, and the male kit 8443 on port 2. Okay, so we load those kits and we are ready to begin our calibration. Now, we go and set our frequency plan. We are going to use a frequency range that starts at 1680 MHz and ends at 2180 MHz. And we are going to use the highest possible test power we have, and that is 6 dBm. We now click Apply to load the frequency plan into the instrument. And for the enhanced isolation calibration to work best, we select the insertable DUT measurement. And we make sure we have this checkbox here ticked. That ensures we use the enhanced isolation calibration technique. Now, at the moment, I have the measurement bandwidth set to 1 kHz, so the first step that we can carry out is the through calibration step. And that is where we simply connect the ends of the test cables together as shown. So, we can make the through measurement at a relatively high bandwidth of 1 kHz. We click on the through button, click OK, and the measurement is made. Now, the rest of the calibration steps will be reflection measurements, and they need to be done at the lowest possible bandwidth. So, we close the calibration window just for a second, and go on to set the bandwidth to 10 Hz. And now, we are ready to make the rest of the calibration measurements with a reduced bandwidth of 10 Hz. So, the next step is to measure two shorts. So, we connect our shorts, and click to make the measurement. Now, the measurement is slow because we are using a 10 Hz bandwidth, so I am going to stop the recording to shorten the video. Ok, the measurement has been done, and now we go to the isolation step. This time we need a short on port 1, and an open on port 2. We make the connections, and click OK. Alright, the next step is to measure the opens. We make the connections, and click OK. And the final step is the loads. Right, so that's complete, and we now apply the calibration. We can now connect the device we want to measure, and click to start the measurement. Ok, so I need to change the graph reference line value on S21 and S12, so that we can see the noise floor. So, let's do that now. Ok, as you can see, we have the out of band response below the center frequency, averaging around 120 dB down, and the upper side a little bit above that. Earlier, I repeated the calibration and measurement also using a 10 Hz bandwidth, but with the averaging set to 10. That approximates to reducing the measurement bandwidth from 10 Hz, down to 1 Hz. I saved the measurement results to disk, and I will now load those results to the memory, so that you can see the difference. Ok, so this is the result. Now we can display the data and the memory. You can see there that on the lower part of the band, we have an average improvement of around 10 dB, with the noise floor down to roughly minus 130 dB. You don't have the same improvement on the upper band, and that probably suggests that we are hitting the floor of the filter, rather than the noise floor of the measurement. Well, there you go. That is a demonstration of how to make large dynamic range measurements. Thank you for watching.